So thank you very much for the introduction, the opportunity to talk here. So I was indeed asked to reflect a little bit on um, my career and how things have changed since I started as a PhD student. Well, it wasn't quite that long ago, although at times it certainly feels like that. And the title of my talk is Life in the Goldfish Bowl, for reasons you will see in a moment. So many of you may actually recognize uh, figures in, in this uh, picture. So in particular, there's one woman there who is, of course, the famous Marie Curie, and you may spot Einstein as well. So when you ask people to talk about physicists, uh, most of the names that people will mention are men. They're also white men. So Isaac Newton, Galileo, Albert Einstein, and indeed Stephen Hawking. And in fact, at the time I was doing my A-level studies and starting to think about you know, going to university, it's a remarkable fact that there were actually <coughs> only two female physics professors in the whole of the UK. Fortunately, I didn't know that fact because I think it might have put me off if I'd actually thought about that. So this is another picture of you know, one of the conferences at the beginning of the 20th century, these great meetings where they discussed you know, the foundations of quantum physics. And you know, you're very struck by the fact that indeed there's one woman there. Again, it's Marie Curie. And you can also play the, sort of, you know, the game of actually sort of spotting you know, people's faces. So these meetings were actually held in Belgium in, by the Solvay Council. There was a sort of funding from Solvay. And these meetings still happen now 100 years, almost 100 years later. So 100 years later, you will notice that the fashions have changed a little bit. You know, the beards and the, and the moustaches have gone. But we still notice that the room is otherwise rather similar. Um, people are still, you know, it's mostly male. I'm actually at the back of the room. I'm kind of hidden. I was invited not because I'm a you know, super distinguished figure, but because the tradition is that you're, you invited people in the vicinity. So Dutch physicists were invited, and I was based in Holland at the time. So this sort of reflection that, you know, in many ways, physics is still quite similar to what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. So as I said, you know, I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to do, and I went to Cambridge in the 1990s to study natural sciences. So natural sciences is where you start in the first year with a mixture of sciences, and then you specialize. And actually, in my, my specific year, very few women continued with physics. There were over 100 in the physics class, but actually there were only three women. So this is all already you know, an interesting sort of question. Why was that so few? Well, it was because the first year physics paper that year was exceptionally difficult. And all the budding female physicists thought, well, I'll go and become a chemist or a material science scientist instead. Um, male physicists with similar marks actually carried on and became physicists. But fortunately, the, you know, the statistics are not so bad these days. So across the country, about 20% of physics undergraduates are, are female. Fortunately, it's not increasing particularly, but at least it's up at 20%. So what was going on at that sort of time? Um, so there were kind of very unconscious things. At the time, I don't think they were ever even articulated by me or my friends. But you know, the, the thing I just told you, that people didn't carry on to do physics in the second and third year, simply because they just didn't think they were good enough. This was about being you know, not confident and being risk averse. So the system didn't you know, really take into account that women are often not keen to take risks. Certainly at that time, patronizing, very paternal attitudes were very widespread. You know, people who, who supervised me would, would, would say things which were not really very appropriate. Female undergraduates were getting unwanted attention from PhD students and postdoc supervisors. It was not particularly easy and almost no lecturers for female. I was taught by one woman through my entire four years at Cambridge. So this is a sort of reflection that at least some things have actually started to improve. Um, as one of three women, I was actually under quite constant scrutiny. Um, so one of the scariest incidents I had was there was this fellow physics student who I kind of knew by sight, but I didn't even know his name. He worked as an intern with my mother in the summer. And it turns out he knew every detail of my life. My mother was lapping it up. You know, she's like, oh, you went out. You, you didn't get home until 2 o'clock that night. Oh, you eat this for breakfast. Oh, you're dating that person. And it was scary to me because I didn't even know this guy at all. You know, he'd just been watching. So this is where I say it was almost like a, you know, a goldfish bowl effect. Again, you know, this, is, this was a particularly anomalous because there were only three women. So the kinds of attitudes that, that I had as I moved on, so this is when I moved on to postgraduate level, it was like, well, you know, you, you were kind of good at undergraduate level, but, you know, things are harder now, and you, you were kind of big fish in a little pond. And in fact, this attitude worked so well on me that when I did the fourth year of the mathematics tripos, the MMath, 
I actually didn't even apply for a PhD position because I thought I wasn't good enough. And then I graduated top in my class. So again, it's sort of saying that actually even women who are really pretty good, I mean, you're not that bad if you're graduating top of your Cambridge class, um, do tend to be quite risk averse and less confident. Sorry, it really doesn't want to work today. So as already said, I became a student of Stephen Hawking's, um, who I should say, because he is a public figure, a well-known figure, he was extremely supportive to me and to, he had two female students during his career. He was certainly supportive to both of us in every way. But in his research group, in that research area, uh, at the time I was a student, there were six women out of 100, two of whom were actually staff, you know, lecturers and readers. And currently, if you look at the same group, we still have, it's still about 100. There are still about six women and actually there's only one female staff member because one has retired. So people often say, well, this is something that's just going to fix itself with time. In 20 years, actually, these statistics really haven't changed. And this is not because they're particularly anomalous. This is something which is, is rather generic. So some of the things which are happening there, um, women and, and other minorities, I mean, this talk is more about women, but you know, wherever I say women, it actually could be replaced by, by other groups who are sort of minorities were often excluded, so there was a culture of going down to the pub, but typically women weren't asked, research projects would be initiated there, so you'd ask something in a seminar, you'd kind of trigger an idea, and then they'd go off and write a paper about it. There was very much a single swim attitude, that was for everybody, it wasn't just for women, um, but it's kind of easier if you've got a kind of buddy group around you. And women sort of felt isolated, but at that time we didn't talk about it, we thought, okay, it's our fault, you know, it's just things we're doing wrong. And if you look at the statistics over many years, they, you know, the women were actually much more likely to leave academia. So really high achieving women went into that group, but actually not very many of them stayed in academia after their PhDs. So a little bit about the field. Um, well, I don't, I don't um, claim blame or credit for Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, but Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory is, of course, um, somebody who is fictionally meant to be in this area of, of theoretical <coughs> particle physics. So it is one of the most ultra-competitive fields um, of research internationally because there are very few university positions available and there are a lot of people competing for them. So every time we advertise even a postdoctoral position, we'll get maybe three, four hundred applications uh, from very, very good people. So typically what you have to do is um, be prepared to do four to eight years of moving around the world, have international postdoc experience, and that would be what you need to actually go and get the permanent staff position. So it's a, it's, you know, it's a very difficult thing to go into. This is also feeds actually into why some groups of people, including women, say, well, you know, actually, there are many other wonderful things to do in life. You know, I actually won't go through this. I'll go and do other things. So my kind of career, where did I go to? So um, I first of all went to uh, Harvard. So that's shown on the left. And then, as um, you know, said before, I actually moved to Amsterdam. I'll come to a moment why I moved to Amsterdam. And this is a picture of our research group from about 2010, 2011. You see, actually, it looks quite good. You're thinking there's lots of women there, but actually they are our administrative staff, most of them. So it's not, not really quite as good as it seems. But, you know, it's still starting to look a little bit better than the pictures I showed you before. <coughs> so where, do, where does, in this kind of ultra-competitive field, where did the kind of gender issues come in? And again, I want to emphasize that it's not always necessarily just confined to women, but they can particularly affect women. So the requirement of international mobility um, does tend to put off women, particularly if they want to kind of, you know, think of having a family, they want to be close to, you know, their parents. The having two to three year fixed term contracts, again, in a period where maybe when you're in your late 20s and early 30s, when you'd actually like to think about you know, having a family and having more permanency. Dual career issues um, these days, you know, m most couples, you know, many couples want to have careers and it's actually balancing the two of them. And as I said, the delay in obtaining a permanent position. So if you kind of count up the years, you know, if you're 25, 26 when you get a PhD and it's, you know, it's taking you six to eight years to get a permanent track position, you're pushing sort of further and further into sort of a period where you really might want to be settled down. The threshold for getting a permanent position, as I said, is extremely high, so very high impact publications required. Typically, to trigger a permanent position these days, people tend to get something like a European ERC grant or a big um, prestigious grant, and that's what triggers the creation of a permanent position. Ranking applications by the volume of publications and citations is extremely common. 
Um, it shouldn't be happening, um, and it isn't happening on official panels, but it tends to happen sort of under the table for university jobs. And that's known to favor people who are particularly well networked. Again, that's not necessarily about gender, because it, you, know, you could be somebody who's a woman who's you know, in extremely well networked in a, in a top group, and you could be a man who's kind of not so well networked. But you know, on average, it do does tend to disfavor um, women. So there are ways, you know, there are, you know, in research um, grants, they do try and think about, you know, how to look more seriously, more carefully about these things. The European Research Council asks for people to put forward <laughs> their best publications to get around the kind of volume of publications. But nonetheless, the idea of being very well networked um, actually plays a role. So when we talk about these things, I mean, improvements in working conditions, you know, thinking very carefully about things which could be affecting one group of people actually helps everyone. It helps both or indeed all genders. But poor working conditions often affect minority groups much more than the people who are in the majority. So if you make things better, it's going to help everyone, but it's going to help in particular those who are the minority groups. Now, I, I reflect on the fact that people often have dual career issues. Um, virtually everyone in my field, virtually all women, we have bad taste in, in our partners because they're almost always actually physicists too. Um, and so this, this person on the, on the right kind of looks like me. The one on the left doesn't particularly look like my husband. But we are both physicists. And at the beginning of our career, we lived apart. He was in Princeton. I was in Cambridge. And then I moved to Holland. And then he moved to Holland. So we actually kind of you know, worked it out together so that we could have two positions in a group in Amsterdam. And then we were hired again together in Southampton in 2012, and that was actually using kind of um, strategic funds linked to the research excellence framework. That was something which kind of facilitated actually dual career hiring in a number of places. So when you have dual careers, I mean, there are many issues, um, but just to pick up on some of them, so both of us have had to make compromises. I, I should say for me, actually, I would have happily stayed in Holland because I was on a nice track there. Both of us have had to sacrifice career progression at time because of dual careers. Okay, you can say that's life. Um, in academia, pro promotion is often triggered by getting external offers, but it's actually quite a lot harder to do this when you're negotiating as a couple, when you've got to actually get two positions at a time. And in some cases, people know that you can treat you badly because you will find it hard to move elsewhere. This is not particularly necessarily about us. It's actually sort of saying that we've seen this playing out over many years with many people. There are cases where people, you know, they think, that they think it's very unlikely you will move, and so you don't get treated as well as you might do. So these are all kind of negative things. I'll come to some positives in a moment. Um, some of the barriers to change. So this specific area... If you've got such a big applicant pool for PhD positions, for postdoctoral positions, and for permanent positions, it's such a big, such a strong applicant pool, you know, there's not much interest in change because there's no problem in actually hiring really, really good people. And actually, many people in this area are prepared to just make the sacrifices. I mean, rightly or wrongly, they're prepared to move around between countries, postpone starting families until their late 30s. In fact, many female women working in this area actually choose not to have any children. Okay, which is, you know, their, their choice. But people actually, you know, basically choose to prioritize their careers. There are schemes which target women, um, not so much in the UK. We, it, it isn't something that the UK has not gone down, but some parts of Europe. But they're kind of a bit of a fudge um, because they tend to appoint high-flying women who would have gotten jobs or grants anyway. So I, I at one time had some, some money targeted for, you know, early career women in Holland but basically everyone who got that already had things like um, ERC grants. So they were already quite high-flying women. So they weren't, they weren't really working very well. There's also you know, subtle things which people are starting to talk about now in a way that they didn't 10 years ago. Um, so flexible working policies. So there tends to be a kind of inconsistent application of these. If women go working part-time, it's sort of often perceived that they're not really prioritizing the career. That's the kind of thing I'm, I'm getting at. Assumptions about family structure. I mean, I've been told personally that I should expect my career to go more slowly because I have children. I work full-time, so I don't really see why that's a reasonable thing to say. Women tend to do a lot of community service. They serve on more committees, particularly when you have quotas for women. 
They tend to do a lot of outreach. Um, people who in, in areas such as physics feel really, really strongly that they want to kind of reach out to women and encourage them to do physics. But there's a real question about whether that's actually valued or whether it comes to career progression, you know, getting research papers, getting income, research grant money is actually going to be valued more. So, you know, you can, you can go into a kind of big rant here. You see it, you see on like American TV shows, this is Lisa Simpson, the whole damn system is wrong. You know, you can kind of start ranting. And it's probably not very, you know, it, it's very frustrating, but it's probably not very helpful to do so. What we have to do is sort of think very carefully about what we can do to make things better. And actually, as I said, the first thing to do is to start talking about it. So 20 years ago, when I started in physics, people wouldn't even have talked about these things. Over the last 10 years, we've at least started to talk about them and think about what we can do. So what has changed over the last 10 years? And so I'm getting it to be a little bit more UK specific. So one thing that's come into play in the university sector is good practice initiatives. Universities looking at how they're treating minority groups. So again, today's discussion is particularly about women in science, so the Athena Swan uh, scheme is particularly relevant for this. But there are other good practice initiatives looking at other minority groups and indeed looking at the intersectionality between them. So the race charter, disability confident leader, Stonewall accreditation. And all of these, you know, are actually kind of about looking at structural barriers to the progression of minority groups, trying to, you know, help and support people to achieve as much as they can. So some of the things that Athena Swan does, um, so many of you in the room I'm sure will know about this, but some of the things, if you look at a lot of the Athena Swan plans from across the UK, Athena Swan in some areas has been linked to research funding, so people have taken it quite seriously. What has it really pushed? So 10 years ago, doing training in, in, in um, equality, um, diversion, diversity and inclusion was pretty uncommon, I would have said. And now, as a result of Athena Swan, this has become you know, really quite mainstream. So thinking about implicit bias, unconscious bias, and actually training people to, to be aware of it. Another thing that's come in is to, to think about workload models. So not just put teaching requirements and um, management requirements, but actually to sort of think more broadly about things that involve community service. So things like um, doing outreach work, Things like, you know, doing extra pastoral service because you're a minority group. So if you are, you know, the only BAME BA -E woman in a department, you know, you may well find that students are gravitating towards you and that's taking up some of your time. Including that time in your workload and giving you a little bit less teaching to account that you're doing that is a kind of, you know, important thing to do. Increasingly, people are looking at performance and promotion based on the full portfolio I think it would be naive to say that you know, research is always going to be an important part of what, you know, what, you're, what is needed for promotion, but looking at the full portfolio and looking at people who are giving very valuable um, contributions in management, education, community as well. And actually being, trying to be a little bit more transparent and consistent about flexible working and seeing how it's applied and making sure that if people do work at, say, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that actually they're not excluded from opportunities because of that, that they still have the opportunity to take on roles that they want to do which will help them develop their careers. So again, I think all of these things have moved forwards and that's a great thing. There are other sort of, you know, small policies. They seem small in themselves, but they start to move the culture. So the idea of email policies, trying to remind people that there's no pressure, there shouldn't be a pressure to reply to emails at all hours, right? You know, that you get something and you should deal with it when it's convenient for you. You're not expected to be working at you know, 10 o'clock on a Sunday evening. Trying to think about deadlines and making sure, again, they're not incompatible with people who are working part-time. Trying to make sure that the most important meetings are, and seminars are within the main part of the day, so you're not excluding people. Um, when I was in Amsterdam, it was actually quite common for really important management meetings to be 6 to 7 in the evening which is incredibly difficult if you have young kids, and that's the only part of the day that you really see them. And again, support around parental leave, so encouragement for more men to take shared parental leave, so not just two weeks of leave, but longer leave, but actually, again, to make sure that they don't feel that this is going to completely knock out their research career, actually making sure that this works well for them. So as I said, I think all of these things are kind of moving in the right direction. 
So this is a quote from um, Julia Buckingham, who's been leading a review of Athena Swan. It's not really for you know to read all the way through, but she's pointing out, you know, what has it achieved? It started the conversation about gender equality at all levels. It's, it's provided a lot more transparency. You've seen where the, you know we've dug out where a lot of the problems are consistently are. There are changes in the culture. Um, there are more support and developmental opportunities for staff. So it's kind of identified that, that some groups of staff were not really getting support in developing their careers and moving on to become associate professor and full professor. And it's offered a way for departments. It's kind of a, you know, Athena Swan applications are, you know, require a lot of data. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but it's actually a way to examine that in a very, very structured way. On the other hand, and again, anyone involved in Athena Swan will be familiar with these things, there are issues about the way this works. So this whole accreditation process involves quite a lot of work, and it's often young women who, who take the lead on that, which is not fair to them at a point where they're trying to develop their research career. There's lots of challenges of getting together the data, and that involves a lot of work. And there's a focus on often on things which are easy. So if you're trying to get an award, you go for the things that you can easily do, and actually, often moving middle-class white women who are doing quite well up the ladder is often an easier thing to do than deal with complex intersectional issues of, say, somebody who has you know, disability issues, somebody who's a single parent, somebody who you know, comes from a BME background, who hasn't got, a, hasn't got a tradition of university education. So, so that's another criticism that's, that's actually made, that because it was kind of you were focusing on getting the award, there was too much focus on things which were easy to do. So, where's the next stage? So I think most universities, including mine, are recognizing that the kite marks of Athena Swan are one part of the story, but that we need to do more of it. And one of the things which has come out in, in my university and other universities around the UK, increasingly over the last couple of years, is that these kind of kite marks don't really address consistently poor behavior. So the kind of things that we have in mind, uh, or I have in mind here, are people behaving with inappropriate remarks, microaggressions, in other words, making people feel that they don't really belong, you know, not treating them with respect consistently. Each thing is too small to be a big deal in itself, but cumulatively has an effect. Then there's kind of, you know, much more, you know, worse behavior, harassment behavior, bullying behavior. And over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of studies of poor behavior of this type by the professional societies. So the Institute of Physics has had reports for a society of chemistry and research councils too. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to give them links to some of this. So one of the things we've been doing in Southampton is actually looking directly at how do you tackle poor behavior? It's a really challenging thing to do and I'm not gonna claim we have the answers. So we have a new approach to an EDI training program the first step is to actually really look in depth at the culture and environment. And the second is to design customized training workshops and then build on that with mentoring. So mentoring is one of the things which consistently right across academia and business is shown to be something which is effective in supporting minority groups to actually progress. It's one of the most single effective measures if you get it in place and working well. So just a glimpse of how we're doing this. What are we doing with assessing culture? So one of the issues that, that, that comes out of Athena Swan is that when you look at big kind of surveys about gender issues or issues of other minorities, they almost necessarily span multiple departments and disciplines. And that can you know, miss really important barriers to progression that are specific to disciplines. So I've described to you specific issues in, in high energy theory, you know, the fact that we need to move abroad for multiple years you know, in, in some disciplines, it could be that you need access to particular scientific resources. You need to get, you know, high, um, high performance computing time. You need access to, you know, particular labs. So what we're doing is kind of digging down into individual university departments and really seeing where the problems are. Traditionally, diversity training is, 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 is designed by diversity professionals. We have coaches, <coughs> management coaches, and there's not a lot of consultation with academics. This is designed in collaboration with academics which involves workload for, for academics, but actually feeds in and makes it a much better kind of uh, training. 
The second thing we're doing, so once you've got that information, is designing your training workshops with your academics, customized to your discipline and department. The idea there is, again, you're, you're hitting the issues that you think are your biggest problems. Everyone in the room who has been asked to sit through training, many of the senior people here, will have experienced frustrating, frustrations that that training doesn't seem to be relevant to them. And so the idea is that this actually engages people more because they see that this is relevant to them. You give carrots, you're sort of trying to say to people, you know you've got problems dealing with undergraduate TTs, you've got this, this training is going to help. We're pulling in, for the expert people in the room, um, we're pulling in ideas of implicit bias training and bystander training. So bystander is when you see bad behavior what do you do about it? Do you call it out then? What do you do? We're pulling that into it, incorporating it. And we have a very experienced facilitator who's kind of guiding discussion on how could you actually tackle issues, which is really important, especially for younger people. It's really not easy when something happens to actually intervene. And then, as I said, the third step is actually to try and build networks between senior and junior staff during the workshop, build relationships and then from that, the mentoring count follows. So it can follow structured programs. We've, we, we, you know, we've got a version of that. We're developing that. Or it can remain more informal. But the idea is that you've actually kind of built some relationships so that people actually feel more open to mentoring. And what you want from the mentoring is that the junior staff, not only are they getting support themselves, but they feel able to report bad behavior if it happens. And senior academics re experience reverse mentoring in the sense that they get more knowledge of what's actually going on. Right, more knowledge of what the problems actually are. So measures of success. Um, this is actually what I'm describing as being done in collaboration with um, social scientists who are actually experts at kind of trying to do these in-depth studies and do measurements of qualitative measurements of whether something's succeeding. So what kinds of things are we looking at? Well, in the short run, actually one thing you'd look for is that more complaints are made. Now, that might sound a little bit strange, but that's telling you that people are more confident to say, do you know what, there is a problem here, I'd like to talk about it. You've got more reports that you know, poor behavior is being commented on or challenged. You've got increased awareness of bullying and increased issues faced by minority groups. I, mean, I know I'm winning when you know, a 60-year-old male white colleague starts worrying about whether this might be an issue for you know, a young BME woman, and actually themselves is actually starting to raise that and say, gosh, we should take this into account. We're actually getting at least, we're starting on the process of awareness. In the longer run, as I said, it's actually part of a research project, and there are quantitative and qualitative measures of culture change, which my wonderful colleagues will actually be engaged in, 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 in looking at and really studying and measuring. So let me conclude. So I started very negatively with, you know, these are, these are the problems that I faced. And, you know, there are things which, some of them have changed, but some of them still need to change more. But on a positive side, things like Athena Swan, kite marks, and these more in-depth kind of approaches to EDI work are really kind of trying to move <coughs> the culture forward. So the idea of this particular training is to put in these ideas of implicit bias, bystander, bullying approach, and actually kind of embed sort of positive behavior, positive leadership. Apologies for the management kind of, you know, the sort of speak, but that's really what we're trying to get at. So clearly there's still a long way to go, but for me actually the positive thing is that academic culture really is starting to change. At least we can start talking about these things and start acting on them. Again, when I was a student, you, you just didn't say anything about it. You just got on with it and, and just shut your eyes and pretended it wasn't there. Thank you.